Welcome to the Skiff Podcast, weekly conversations on global travel trend lines. The average number of vacation days taken by U.S. workers continues to decline, and small business owners are no different. In a recent survey, it was revealed that despite knowing the importance and benefits of completely unplugging from work, only 25% of small business owners are actually able to do so. And even then, nearly three quarters worry about the work and responsibilities they're missing during their time off. In this special edition of the Skift podcast, we're taking a look at why small business owners are especially susceptible to experiencing anxiety when considering taking a vacation, as well as some potential solutions. On today's episode of the Skiff Podcast, we're speaking with Ida Kroll and Katie Dennis. Ida, who's joining us via Skype, is an entrepreneur, world traveler, and founder and CEO of Eventland in New York City. You may know her better as Mrs. Life Lover. We'll get to that a bit later. We're also joined by Katie Dennis, Senior Program Director of Project Time Off, a U.S. travel initiative which aims to shift culture so that using personal time off is not considered frivolous, but essential to improving personal health and can be a business investment with proven returns. Full disclosure, this podcast has been produced by SkiftX. Our advertiser is Marriott Rewards Premier Business Credit Card from Chase, introducing new benefits that make it even easier for small business owners to take a well-deserved break. Find out more about the new enhanced path to gold elite status by visiting MarriottPremierBusiness.com. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) I'm so glad to have you guys here. First off, I'd like for each of you to tell us a bit about yourselves and your relationship with travel, be it for business or leisure. Katie, do you mind starting? Sure. So I love to travel. I wouldn't be in this field if I didn't. And I get to encourage everyone to take vacation time as part of my job, which is a great job. Um, I also get to approve time off requests from my team, which is one of my favorite things that I get to do. Uh, But generally, we don't travel enough. So I think we're trying to work against that and get people out there and taking their time off. And speaking of not traveling a lot, Ida, I heard a rumor that you don't travel a lot. <sighs> not at all. No, I travel a lot. Um, I since I'm, you know, since I was a, a child, a travel was a big part of my life. Um, I lived in uh, maybe like seven, eight countries, and then I also, you know, stayed in multiple countries. A lot, you know longer for a longer period of time each place um so when I started my business I made it a goal that travel should be a big part of that um because I I have a very global nature and I'm from Denmark but at this point I feel like I'm a mix of all the places I've been to and all the places I lived and all the places I work so travel is a very very personal part of me and who I am Excellent. Well, in a survey that was commissioned by Marriott Rewards Premier Business Credit Card, it was revealed that small business owners actually find a multitude of benefits in taking personal vacations. Um, Two thirds of small business owners think taking a personal vacation benefits their business, including improved focus, creativity, and motivation. It sounds like the majority of the vacation that you take is for work, though. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of a problem. Um, I am actually, after this very podcast, taking the first real vacation, like unplugging completely for, like, since since I started this business in 2014. So not very uh, healthy, probably. But when you have your, you know, when you own your own business, sometimes it's just not a, you know, it's not an option to be on vacation. Um, so the only vacation I had the last couple of years is actually, um, you know, has been, you know, if I traveled somewhere for business and I took, you know, half a day off or maybe if I was lucky a day off. So, um, I want to change, make a change here. And, um, and now I have two weeks vacation, um, where I'm also going to travel. I'm not going to stay one place. Uh, so but it is vacation and I'm so excited. 
I'm so glad that you're going to take that vacation. Um, I'd actually love to get Katie's perspective on how vacation plays into overall company organizations. Um, Is it something that needs to be encouraged from the top down? So yes, it does need to be. And I think what's interesting about this is we've done a lot of research and in survey after survey after survey, employees consistently say that vacation time is really important to them, you know, upper 90s, like universal. Um, But what we see again and again is that they're not taking their time off. And it's not that these people are liars or that it's not important to them. It is. But the thing is, the most powerful influencer to them is the office. It's not necessarily what they want to do. So I think that's where we have a little bit of a disconnect. Um, And that's where I think companies can be really, really helpful in stepping in and saying, hey, this is the time that you earned. You deserve to take this and we want you to do it. And I think what's great about people who travel for business is that they're already in some unique places that they maybe have never been to before. And you can tack on a day. It doesn't have to be, you know, a two-week trip sounds great, and I would love to do that, and I'm very jealous of you right now. (laughs) Um, But it doesn't have to be that big trip. It can be, you know, a long weekend or a four-day weekend or something simple once you're already in a place that you want to be. And I think that's something that I've certainly done because I do get to travel a lot for work, trying to take advantage of the places that I am, even if it is just one extra day, because it's amazing how much you can see. I went to seven sites in Seattle in less than six hours (laughs) when I was there last time. So I'd like to go back, but it almost plants that seed in your mind. It's like, I've seen a little bit. Now I want to see more. And it's amazing how that, how travel can have that effect on you. Yeah. I think that also makes sense. And I think, you know, from a business perspective, having the opportunity to take a mental break, which, you know, 78% of people said in the survey commissioned by Marriott Rewards Premier Business Credit Card, um, 78% of small business owners said that it felt like they had the opportunity to take a mental break and 72% said that it refreshed their creativity. So it sounds like it's also a business investment at the same time. Yeah, it's that's right in line too with all the HR leaders and managers that we talk to. They all believe that there are innovation and creativity benefits, that employees are more productive, that they're better overall performers. Um, I think it's definitely harder for small business owners to take that break because you know you are a little bit more of a streamlined operation and you might have, you know, one employee or you might have five, but either way it could be a very small number all the more reason you need that energy. And without that energy, you're going to start to burn out. And, you know, if you've got a small team and you burn out, you don't want to work with that person. (laughs) You know, you're walking on eggshells. Everyone knows that person who needs a break. And it's like, hey, why don't you take a breather? So I think, you know, it's really important for small business owners (laughs) to prioritize it and plan for it. And the planning is critical. Without the planning, you're not going to be able to take the time. And, you know, if you don't plan it well, you're not going to be feeling like, okay, I can, I can take this break and disconnect a little bit. You're going to be plugged in and it's not really going to be much of a break. Ida, can you tell us more about the inspiration for Mrs. Life Lover? Yeah, sure. So I started Mrs. Life Lover uh, a couple of months back um, kind of to, to, to set my own personal uh, love for, for travel apart from the business part of me. Uh, so I started a Twitter account and I started a Facebook account called Mrs. Life Lover um, because, um, yeah, I, I love to travel and I wanted to document all the personal experiences I have to travel, both for, you know, my friends' sake, my family's sake, and, and um, you know, whoever wanted to check in on my, my, my social media profile sake, but actually also for my own sake to kind of keep a diary of all the, the memories I have where it hasn't, doesn't have to do with work. Um, I just came to the conclusion that that was important because when you, when you work and when you travel all the time, it's always like you can forget about yourself a little bit sometimes. So yeah. So, and I, I already have a very, very strong love for social media um, so I was like, let me, let me share my, my, my personal, uh, travels with, with the world. Katie, do you feel like that, but and no offense, I think it's a fabulous idea. Um, and I envy your ability to keep up with your social networks when on vacation, but I feel like the idea of like completely connecting or disconnecting for me when traveling involves like 
not feeling any <laughs> semblance of responsibility <laughs> to my social networks or my job or anything. Um, do yeah. you feel like, or do you have any research that kind of looks at that? that nothing, nothing quantitative, but I think ultimately disconnecting is the ultimate debate, right? Is that should you do it? Should you not do it? Like what's best? There is no one best answer for this. Some people need to disconnect because that's the only way they're going to feel like, okay, I'm calm. I can take a break. Some people will have a nervous breakdown if they don't check in with their email. So you're not really getting the health benefits of time off if you're constantly panicked about what's happening. Um, I think there are some companies that have interesting tools for coping with some of this. Uh, Huffington Post has something they call their email detox program. And this is where if you are an employee there, and you go on vacation, you have the option of turning on this program that if someone sends you an email, they get a response back that says, thank you for your email. It's been deleted. I will be back on this date if you'd like to get back with me. Otherwise, you can reach out to this person. Yeah, everyone gasps, right? It's this horrible. <laughs> oh my God, how? Oh, um, it's it's terrifying, gasping, right? Yeah. It is a little terrifying. But when you think about it, how much stuff is resolved by the time you get back? How much does need to be handled? And you waste hours going through your inbox that you know you could get that time back in productivity. So in a way, I think it's a really smart tool. Um, I think, I, Ida, you touched on something that I thought was really interesting when you talked about your team stepping up. This is another benefit that people don't often think about, but when when the boss or someone senior steps out, someone has to step in. You know, it's not that the work stops happening, it's that you get the chance to train people up. And there's uh, a company called Motley Fool in Alexandria, Virginia, and they have this thing that they call the Fool's Errand, which is basically an impromptu, you have to take, I think it's a week off within the next two weeks. So it's a short notice period of time that you're out. And it sounds like a great perk. They give it away at staff meetings and, you know, somebody wins each month and it's cool. But the whole purpose of this is that they can cross train their employees. So if somebody's out without that much notice, then they can't manage the work. They consider that a single point of failure for their company, which I think is a really interesting way of looking at it and very different from what you typically hear. But there really is a great opportunity to coach people up. I mean, I have a small team. We're only five people. I was out for maternity leave for four months. And, you know, it's one of those things where what's going to happen? It was fine. Everything was fine. So if I can leave for four months, people can leave for four days. Yeah. <laughs> we all need to calm down a little. <laughs> That's really interesting. I think, you know, it, it does feel like ver a very perceptive move for an organization to understand that their business operations can be almost led by the idea of taking vacation. And I think what we've found again and again is the boss is the most powerful influencer over employees' time. Uh, it's actually above family in pretty much every study we've done. Not not by a lot, but like a percentage, but it's still, you know, even if it's anywhere close, it seems kind of silly. So knowing that the boss is such a powerful influencer, it's really critical to set a positive example and also tell your employees that you have to go. And some people have said, well, isn't it ridiculous that you have to tell people to take vacation? That seems so silly. It does seem silly, but at the same time, it makes a big difference. And it's a great way to say to employees, we value you and your contributions to this organization organization and we want you to be rested and whole and happy here. So it's a really, really easy way of taking advantage of something that's probably already part of your policy. And by encouraging it, you can do wonders for your retention, for your happiness and for your employee engagement. So we talk a lot about structured work, uh, traditional work. Uh, Ida mentioned that her entire team is based on freelancers. We talk a lot about, uh, you know, how freelancers are going to be a much larger portion of the workforce in the United States, this kind of idea of uberization of the economy. Uh, has your organization looked into kind of vacation patterns for freelancers? And, you know, are there some some big differences there in terms of what happens compared to, to more structured uh, kind of work arrangements? So fewer people on your staff, more pressure, right? And it, it becomes that much harder. And we do see less vacation usage in smaller companies. Uh, freelancers, I think it's particularly difficult because, you know, you, you each would eat what you kill, right? So I, I think that we certainly understand those pressures and it all depends on the kind of work you do, but there is usually some way to take it, you know, and a lot of these people who are freelancers might be traveling for work already. And I think that's a really great way to take advantage of, you know, just a day here and there. It really doesn't have to be this big trip. And I think sometimes when we say travel, there's this notion that there's got to be this massive trip. You don't even actually have to go anywhere. I mean, you could take you know, explore your own city. Uh, New York has their great See Your City campaign that encourages people to like cross a bridge, have a meal in a different borough, just simple things like that. But if you are already out there, um, I was actually in New Orleans recently for work and I had 
never been to New Orleans before, apart from when I was pregnant. I feel like that doesn't count. Um, so I got to explore a little bit. And at first I just went to, you know, the garden district to run. And then I was like, oh, I want to go back there. So I ended up tacking on a day and I stayed at the Marriott New Orleans. Um, so I, I added a day to my, uh, my business trip and got to see a little bit more of the city. And it wasn't, it didn't feel like a big commitment and it didn't seem like something where I felt like I missed a whole lot when I was back in the office. So I think for people who are freelancers, find a way to be advantageous. If you feel like you can't take a big long break, you know, try a series of short ones because I think this idea that work is a marathon isn't actually true. I think work is a series of sprints anymore with the way that we work. So you've got to, you got to find rest and recovery, even if it's short. Ida, you mentioned that you're looking to take kind of like a two week vacation, right? Is this, uh, so is it just not enough to be able to kind of work from anywhere and, and kind of enjoy the benefits of, of that lifestyle? And, um, you know, what are you looking for when you, when you plan this kind of two week, let's say hiatus? Um, most of all, I don't want any plans. So my husband and I, and I just, um, rented a car and we're going to drive to LA and we're going to continue from there to, uh, San Francisco. And I actually don't have a return ticket. Like I haven't booked my, our flights back because I didn't know what they exactly we wanted to go back. And, uh, we have no hotels booked. We have no, you know, we have nothing booked. We have, we don't know like the, the route of our journey because I, as an event planner, I am very, very OCD with everything. Everything there is lists for every th- part of my life. Elsewise, it it would fall apart. So when I travel for complete leisure, um, I don't want any plan. I don't plans. I don't want any lists. I don't want, you know. I just want to go with the flow and see what happens. That stresses me out. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually done that before, and I find it is extremely cathartic for somebody who's planning constantly to be, and also the fact that we are enabled with technologies and, you know, different things that can afford us the opportunity to just not have that plan. Um, I think it kind of also fits into the way that the dare I say, millennial lifestyle is. It's like you want to sort of be able to do what you want to do when you want to do it. That's the stereotype at least. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of the uh, research that was done around small business owners um, kind of leaned into millennials versus boomers. And the fact that 42% of millennial small business owners worry more about their work when they take time off compared to 17% of boomers. Um, I mean, there are also, there are other statistics around this sort of like general mindset difference. Um, 81% of millennial small business owners are hoping to travel for personal vacations more next year compared to 60% of boomers who probably took their vacations. Is this something that you see across the board? Yeah, I think that's pretty consistent with a lot of the findings that we've had. And I think sometimes people forget about the millennial environment. So there's this idea that they're entitled and they're spoiled, and that's kind of the go-to narrative. But when you really dig into it, first of all, a lot of them are early on in their careers. So they're they're going to want to prove themselves. That's not different from previous generations. I think that's pretty consistent. What is different, though, is the economic environment that they graduated into. Many of them were in the middle of the Great Recession or the after effects that lingered for a long time. Um, and then the other thing is this is the first totally connected generation to be in the workforce. They're a little bit of a unique animal in that, that it's always been an option to connect to the office outside of the office. There is no physical space and there never really has been for them or there hasn't needed to be. So I think we do have a very unique experience for millennials in the workforce. And what we're noticing is that they're a lot worse about taking vacation. They feel more guilt they feel more like they need to be showing complete dedication or perceived complete dedication. Um, I think there's a little bit of fear too. You know, the economy, they they kind of went into, they said, okay, well, I want to make sure that I'm proving my value. And, you know, the proving ground has just changed dramatically. So we do see a very big difference in their approach to vacation time versus other generations. Do you um, have any sort of like tactics or, or tips that you would give those individuals to help them feel 
maybe not even just compelled, but like it's necessary to take vacation? The boss is hugely influential to millennials. It is to everyone, but overwhelmingly the number one influencer to millennials, far above their own families. So I think this is something that if you are a manager of a millennial, it's certainly something to consider. If you say, hey, it's important to take your time off and I want you to do it, and you are, you're also leading by example, which is critical, nonverbal communication speaks volumes, uh, that's going to be a really important component of managing a millennial. And I think some people are dismissive of that. It's just, oh, well, they're spoiled. They'll take everything they're given. I don't need to say anything. And that's not what we're seeing at all. So I think if you are managing millennials, understand that that's important. Also, a lot of millennials are managers now, about a quarter of them. So they're starting to step into those management roles. They're, you know, half the workforce now, this is going to be something that becomes a bigger issue because as they start managing others, then some of this thinking could trickle down and it could get worse and worse. We really are a 24-7 you know, country on the, <laughs> the verge of burnout all the time. So we really don't need this thinking to get any worse because it really is bad for us. It's bad for our health. It's bad for our happiness. It's bad for our families. And you know, we can prove that out a thousand times, but until we, until we really start taking action in the workplace, it's only going to get worse. And also on the other side of that are all of the positive benefits of tra of taking time off and traveling the, you know, mental break and increased creativity and feeling more motivated when you get back. Um, can you explain more about how that is actually, you can see as a business owner, the return on investment? So I think one of the biggest things you can do is actually sit down and plan your time off. It doesn't have to be exact. You don't have to have your hotels and all that figured out. Um, but having a sense of what you're going to do in the year, it first of all makes you a more responsible employee because it kind of says, okay, I know I'm going to be gone at these times and you can plan around that. So you're more prepared and all that. But people who sit down and plan their time out at the beginning of the year or whatever their year is are happier in nine out of the nine categories we measured. So that happiness is substantial. You know, obviously some places like personal relationships and relationships with children, that's kind of expected, but they are significantly happier in their professional success and their personal financial situations which are two of the things that give people anxiety about taking time off. So I think the happiness element of, is, of it is huge, and that's going to do a tremendous amount in keeping employees engaged, wanting to stay with your company, and you know thriving there too. I think we also know the creativity element of it is enormous. And I think if you do the same thing day after day after day, you're not really going to come to the office with new ideas. And I think we, we really thrive on ideas. Like the U.S. is an innovation economy. We're very dependent on it. You know, We can come up with these great companies like Apples and Googles and all that stuff. But we need to be able to take a break every so often. And, you know, I think our favorite anecdote now is that uh, the Hamilton musical was something that he came up with while on vacation. You really need that space uh, to be creative. So if you, you know, I think there's all sorts of great things that companies do. They have entrepreneur in residence programs. They have nap pods. They have pogo I, I mean, There's a million different things that you can do. But if you really encourage the vacation, that's probably already part of your policy. You're going to realize those benefits pretty quickly. Uh, Katie, can you talk a little bit about kind of the historic trends of vacationing and what uh, what your team expects kind of going forward as we look to the new economy and kind of these new lifestyles of work? Uh, are we going to be taking more vacations? Or are we going to be taking fewer vacations going forward? I hope we're taking more. But when you look back, um, so we did decide to look at a historical trend line of vacation usage. And we, it went back to about the 70s when BLS started measuring some of this stuff. Uh, so from the 70s to about 2000, we were really consistent. It took about 20.3 days on average. And that was a very long-term average. And then in 2000, we just start plummeting. So this idea, you know, people say to me, oh, well, we're not going to be France. We don't need to be France. We can be the U.S. 15 years ago. And we've actually lost a full work week of vacation in 15 years. So this has been a relatively short order thing. And I think most people want to know, well, why did this happen? You know, <laughs> what has gone on? So we looked at a couple different factors and we looked at... Um, we looked at consumer confidence and we looked at unemployment, so a couple economic indicators to see if there was a correlation. And we found absolutely no correlation, actually. So uh, when, then we turned to technology. And when you look at internet adoption, as internet adoption goes up, vacation usage goes down. And I think we can all relate to that because the workplace is now in our hands, right? You really can't get away from it if you, well, <laughs> unless you really try hard, right? So I think it's something that, you know, it doesn't mean that technology is a problem necessarily. It just means that we need to be very intentional about our time. It's not going to, ha you're not going to find time. I hear people say, well, if I can find the time, 
the days of finding time are over. We have to make time and be active about it. Otherwise, we will not reverse that trend line. We will not come anywhere close to reversing that trend line. So I think, you know, to the degree that technology is a great thing, I mean, you know, we're having this conversation halfway across the country. Um, there's a lot of really cool things about that. And, you know, it's brought wonderful things to our lives that make a lot of things about work much simpler. But when it comes to actually taking vacation, we just have to be very specific about carving out that time because the benefits of doing it are enormous, both for the individual and for the employer. So you talked a little bit, uh, you mentioned technology and clearly the, uh, the 800 pound gorilla is the, the mobile phone or the smartphone that's sitting on your desk or next to your bed at all times. What, uh, you know, have you seen any correlation in terms of vacation and mobile? Uh, you know, you, you, there's a lot of thought around, uh, you know, mobile giving us an opportunity to kind of, uh, work from anywhere. Is that, uh, you know, is, is there kind of a blurring of the lines between what is work and what is vacation these days? And is it all driven by mobile? There, there's a lot of blurring of those lines because the office is omnipresent now. It's not something, it's not a place anymore. It's, it's kind of just what you do. So this ability to work from anywhere, it's a blessing and a curse, right? You know, you can, you can check in if you need to, or if something goes wrong, it's a lot easier to be found. Um, at the same time, it's really hard to resist. I know, you know, on my phone, when I see that little red circle pop up, it's hard not to see, okay, what is that? Cause you know, maybe it's something really exciting or maybe it's something that's, you know, I just want to delete it cause I don't want to deal with it. Or maybe it's, an ex you know, an event or something like that. It's never an event for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think you just kind of want to know, maybe it's an emergency nine times out of 10, it's fine. And you know, it's not going to be a big deal, but I think it's just very easy to check in. And personally, I feel like I shouldn't be admitting this out loud. I like to check email in the morning when I'm taking time off. I, I feel better that way. I feel like I've got a better handle on things. Um, I have other people on my team who want to totally disconnect. Uh, one of the women who works on my team, she will turn off her email so she is not tempted to check. And that's the way that she chooses to go about things. So I think everyone has to figure out what's going to be the most beneficial for them. But the workplace is everywhere. That's not going to change. So I think that's just something that we have to figure out what are the best tools for managing it uh, for each individual person. What are some of the, uh, back to you, Katie, in terms of uh, work, work employer policy uh, before the show, we talked a little bit about li limitless vacations and uh, kind of new arrangements with em employees and employers. Can you talk a little bit about this trend with limitless vacation? It sounds like uh, it sounds like a beautiful thing if you're uh, working for one of these companies. Are there kind of realities that you've seen or any stats that you can share? So I think in terms of trend might be a bit of an overstatement. Uh, only about 2% of companies are offering unlimited vacation now. So it's not necessarily something that's really grabbing hold. There's so many stories about it. I think people love to talk about it. And actually, I love to talk about it because it is a really great way to start a conversation about what we need to do around any vacation policy. Uh, what we see most often is employees don't want unlimited because they want to understand boundaries. They want boundaries. They want to know what's appropriate. Um our, I was talking to somebody the other day who said he used to go trick-or-treating and there was a woman in his neighborhood that would hold out a bowl of coins and she would say, take whatever you feel is appropriate. <laughs> it's like, do you run off with the whole bowl? Do you take like a penny? What is what is appropriate? And I think unlimited vacation is very much the same thing. It's you take whatever you feel is appropriate. But if you work for someone who's not really doing that or you're not really sure, most people err on the side of caution. So I think a great example of this is Kickstarter. Kickstarter had a set number of days and then they went to unlimited because I think most companies are very positive in the way that they approach it when they decide to do unlimited. It's, you know, again, we talked about the 24-7 office environment and we don't work the same way. And a lot of people, when they implement unlimited, they're saying, okay, well, we expect you to be responsible and, you know, we want to treat you like an adult. So we trust you to manage your time, you know, because your time is not really the same as it used to be. Um, or they want to say, okay, this is a great way. We're going to get the best available talent and we're going to keep them. And, you know, this is a great tool for that. I think most companies are very well intended when they go to unlimited. However, sometimes it's, okay, here's our new policy and that's it. So you really, if you're going to do something like that, you have to make it very clear what your expectations are. Uh, some companies have mandatory minimums, which I think is a smart way of going about it because it kind of says, okay, we have unlimited, but like you got to take at least this much. Uh, Netflix is the pioneer in the unlimited vacation space and they have their whole freedom and responsibility culture manifesto. So everything kind of plays into this larger 
uh, narrative for their office. And I think that works really well too. And their, their CEO is on record saying, I take six weeks of vacation a year. Um, Kickstarter found out when they went to Unlimited that people were taking less time than before. And that was not their motivation. And that was not what they intended. They wanted it to be a really positive thing. So they went back to a set number of days to get their employees to take more time off. So I think with any vacation policy, Culture and context are key. So you've got to have the right culture to be encouraging, no matter what your policy is. And you have to give people the context of what's appropriate, what do you expect them to do, what do you want them to do? Because people are not taking that initiative on their own with unlimited or other policies. Interesting. I wonder whether or not employees, um, you know, as job seekers, let's say this day and age, are looking at the limitless vacation policy and are they saying, oh, is this a perk or is this... um, you know, a statement from the company saying, hey, listen, you're expected to get to basically work until the job is done. I think sometimes it might be a little of the latter. It's possible. Um, I, I, most people that we've talked to, and we've done a ton of focus groups, and we've asked this question, um, we've asked it about unlimited or use it or lose it, because those are kind of the two most polarizing policies out there. And Unlimited people are very gun shy about. They don't want that. They really do want boundaries. They're like, I just want to know what I have to take. You know, it's kind of like giving someone a budget and saying, okay, you know, this is the house you can buy or saying, pick a house you want to buy. <laughs> and like, we're going to tell you how much money you have later. So I think that's kind of the, the issue is that, you know, you, you really need some kind of compass to navigate. I just used a lot of different metaphors. Um, <laughs> probably too many. I like them all. <laughs> Perhaps, Katie, can you talk a little bit about some of the upcoming work that uh, your organization has planned uh, in terms of research, outreach, et cetera? So the next study that we've got coming up will be in August, and we're going to look at what makes what we would call a work martyr. So these people who subscribe to the philosophy that, you know, no one else can do the job and I don't want to be seen as replaceable. I feel guilty when I take my time off. We, we came up with some of the different qualifiers of what we would consider someone who's a bit of a work martyr. Um, and what we're finding is there's a ton of negative outcomes from subscribing to that brand of thinking. First of all, they had to say yes to four different questions like that. And we had a sample size that is larger than I care to reveal. Um, so there's a lot of people out there that feel like that. Um, and what we're finding is record levels of stress, unhappiness, uh, dissatisfaction with company, job, empl- across the board. So really there are huge negatives. We're also finding that they're not as successful. And this is something that actually came up in our most recent study. People who take 11 or more days are more likely to get a bonus than people who take 10 or fewer, which we thought was somewhat interesting because I think there is something to that recharging productivity. You might be seen as a better performer. So we're finding that, you know, you might feel like you're sacrificing yourself for the company and that you're giving it your all. It might not be recognized the same way you feel it's recognized, which I think is, you know, certainly an important point. Um, Looking further down the road, we're going to be doing something that's a little bit more workplace focused. So aimed at, you know, the HR, C-suite leadership of these companies saying, hey, these are some things for you to think about. First and foremost, um, for every company that doesn't have unlimited or use it or lose it, there's going to be some time that they have to carry on their books. So we call that vacation liability, the the time that employees can be paid out for or can bank or whatever the case may be. Um, Last time we did this study, it was $224 billion of vacation liability, 66 billion of which was accrued in just a year. Uh, I think what should be really shocking about that number is not that you're not going to have to cut a check right away or anything like that, but that number represents the amount of time people aren't taking. And that should be shocking to whatever company leader sees it because it really is a problem. Um, so we're going to be looking at that. And then we're also going to be looking at managers and what they can do and you know what is their current behavior, what are the areas for improvement. So that'll be later this fall. I think that's really interesting um, in terms of almost like setting up a guide based on research, like what the best practices should be. Um, you know, as a small business owner and starting a company, you may not have the perspective of what is going to be the best vacation policy, and you may not even know that there are business implications. So I talked to this one small business owner in Cincinnati, Ohio, who makes this uh, glowing tape that they use on fire escapes and exits and like on firefighters' helmets so they can see each other if it's really smoky. Anyway, it's a very cool product. Um, But he was saying, I can't afford to pay as much as, you know, the big companies in my area. There's a ton of R&D out here. 
and it's really great, but I can't compete with the bigger companies. So the way I do it is work-life balance and quality of life. So I have a very generous vacation policy and I'm very lenient on like, you know, hours that they choose to be in the office because that's the way that I can compete with the big guys. And I thought that was a really interesting perspective because it does give you the ability to go after some of that top tier talent that you might not be able to give, get them on salary, but you can get them on work-life balance. Does Project Time Off do global research on vacations or it's a primarily? No, we are uh, exclusively U.S. research. Um, Expedia does some interesting stuff on the global scale in terms of, you know, what's given out from different countries. And, you know, we're, the U.S. is always at the uh, the basement bottom of that. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's not a whole lot of other countries that have this same issue is what we're finding. Is you see it sometimes in Asia. Um, we actually met with some people from Japan who are working on a similar campaign there, and they came to see what we were doing and, you know, what it was like, um, which was very interesting, actually, because I think they're, they might be a little crazier than us over there. So, um, <laughs> so I, I think it's, in, and the government is actually considering assuming it as a, a thing that they need to do in their country, which I thought was fascinating. And, you know, that's not something that um, I don't think we'd ever do here, and it's certainly not something Project Time Off is pursuing. I think our... Our position is there is a very clear business case for encouraging your employees to take your time off. So, you know, that's that's something that we should pursue just because not only is it the right thing to do, you're going to realize tremendous benefits as a business by encouraging that time. So there is no legal obligation to offer vacation in the U.S.? No, there is not a legal obligation. Um, every state has different laws, and that's where it can get a little bit squirrelier. Uh, we were talking a little bit before about unlimited vacation. So um, in California, they have very unique labor laws where use it or lose it is illegal. So you, you have to pay employees for the time that they work. Um, so something like unlimited is a great way to keep costs off your books if that's something that you're concerned about as a company. Um, as long as you're encouraging it for your employees, it can be a win-win. But I think it's just making sure that it's a win-win, not just a company win, is going to be you know important. Um, so yeah, everyone's labor laws are different, but generally speaking, no, there's no mandated requirement for leave in the U.S. Not even for federal holidays. What about children? Um, you know, focus here is small businesses. Children kind of add to the stress and uh, to the obligation, the ability to take vacations. Is there something that we need to think about there? So we did a survey with kids 8 to 14, and this was probably my favorite work we've ever done because kids are brutally honest where, you know, adults will lie to you about their happiness and their health and, you know, their marriage is perfect. They work out six times a week and all sorts of things like that, um, that I don't believe at all. But, um, but kids are the complete opposite. They are brutally honest. We ask them, you know, what's the last event your parent missed out on? And they're like, oh, I'll tell you. <laughs> like, they, they don't hold back at all. So it's really, really fascinating. And what we found overall is it doesn't have to be a big deal thing. You know, I'm not going to lie on the verbatim we got lots of Disney in there. <laughs> you know, they, they certainly enjoyed those in terms of memorable trips with their parents. Um, but a lot of people, it was like, I liked it when my mom came on my class field trip. I liked it when my dad took me camping. A lot of this stuff was relatively simple and didn't necessarily have to be a big vacation. One girl actually said, my dad and I went to Target and we bought a slip and slide and set it up in the backyard. So, I mean, it can be really, really simple. But like when you're a kid, Think how cool it was to go to a hotel when you were a kid, right? Like how much fun it is. I, I just took my two kids on a trip because my best friend got married and we stayed at this hotel and I have a four-year-old. So she got tiny boxes of cereal and there was a pool and she it was she was in <laughs> heaven. And that's something that she's going to talk about forever now. You know, we can't, we're not going to be able to go anywhere without tiny boxes of cereal. So, <laughs> but it's, that's the kind of stuff that like you can make a memory really easily with kids and that stuff really matters and it does carry weight because they see a lot. We found that uh, six out of seven kids said they saw their parent bringing work stress home, which is a massive number. And, you know, even for me with kids, I always thought, oh, well, if I'm doing stuff and they're occupied, it doesn't really matter. They don't see it. It doesn't matter. They do see it. And they actually, like three out of four kids says, you know, my parents unable to disconnect when they leave the office. So, you know, I, we would never say disconnecting is the right way or the wrong way. You know, I think everyone is different. However, I thought it was a really important thing to realize how aware kids are of our connectivity and how it affects them. In terms of parents and non-parents taking time off, is there any statistic showing a difference between whether or not they take more or less time off? 
There's not necessarily a huge difference there. Um, I think that people with younger children tend to take a little bit less. And, you know, that could be because they're moving on further in their careers. It could be because young children are a pain to travel with. I can speak from personal <laughs> experience on that. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to tell exactly why. But we did take a look at some of the different groups that have a lot of time available and, you know, want to take more time. And that, you know, mid-career professional with young children is certainly one of the groups that has a hard time with it because they do feel a lot of pressure in the workplace. And they, they're the person who really needs their boss to say, hey, you deserve a break, you know, make sure you're, make sure you're taking some time for yourself, go be with your family, because that's what they want to do. But again, what we want to do, and what we actually do, there's a big divergence there. And a lot of that relies on permission in the workplace. So I mean, if you have someone who's going on a business trip or something like that, and they're going somewhere interesting, you know, that's a great way to encourage them take another day or two, you know, see where you are. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be going to Hawaii for work in September, which is amazing. And my husband's going to come with me and my mother has volunteered to watch the children. And, you know, I, I don't know if I'll ever be able to get there again. So I want to take advantage of it. And I don't just want to see a conference hall. I want to see, you know, other places. So um, it's a great opportunity and I'm absolutely going to take advantage of it. And, you know, not everywhere, <laughs> not everyone gets to go to Hawaii. I've also gone to Minnesota in February. So there's, <laughs> there's been a lot of diversity of my travel experiences. Um, but even then I took a little bit of time to see my aunt. So <laughs> every, everyone's got their thing that they can figure out to do. And it's, it's well worth it if you can take advantage of it. I think another one of the benefits of traveling for work is the opportunity to use like a business credit card where you collect rewards and be able to spend those rewards, maybe even for personal use. I think, you know, in the survey, um, most small business owners actually had a business rewards card, 84%. Um, and that nine in 10 of them would use their rewards points on themselves. So I think that's another thing that uh, business owners can consider when offering opportunities to their employees. Well, if you travel a lot for work and your employees get the benefits of those points, at least they can feel a little better about, you know, constantly being on a plane or in a hotel. You know, I think that's something that's really positive. Um, well, thank you guys both so much for being a part of today's Skiff podcast. Ida, I hope that you have an excellent time on your vacation. And Katie, thank you so much for joining us today. 